It's Comrade Rhys here and today I'm going to be doing a video on the Republican movement in Ireland and why I'm very sympathetic to it. As you may already know, I really don't like my country to the point where it even makes me sick to look at the Union Jack or to hear the anthem God Save the Queen. This is because when I look back and see Britain's colonial past, a history which the British ruling class openly denies and then wonders why the countries that they pillaged don't fucking like them, it makes me sick. In 2016, a YouGov poll here in my country showed that a huge chunk of the people in Britain are in fact proud of the UK's colonial past, which is fucking disgusting. But at the same time, it's not surprising either. This is because if we look at the typical mindset of a citizen of an imperialist country, they generally think that their country's military conquests are the best thing to happen to the world. Unlike the United States that tries to cover its own ass, if you like, when carrying out imperialism, such as using the notion that a country they're going to crush has dangerous weapons of mass destruction that need to be destroyed. Oh, here's the big one. Human humanitarian aid. Britain, on the other hand, was just openly empire building. There wasn't much misinformation given to the people by the British Empire. It was just a basis of having superiority over so-called savage or uncivilized people, which is clearly empire building. The fact that Britain was so open about its empire building is what disgusts me. You know, what disgusts me, the, the, the fact that Britain was so open about its empire building, and then for people to say that they're proud of that, that's what disgusts me. But while it is disgusting, the sole purpose of the pillage that the British Empire carried out was to benefit the colonizer. And we have seen that from Britain's empire building days to even today in its imperialist phase. We still see that mentality. A lot of people here in my country are completely fine with living their day-to-day -day lives knowing that the imperialists are brutally oppressing the third world. The only sort of resistance, if you like, that you would see from British people is actually for the benefit of the imperialist soldiers such as don't send our boys to a war that they don't need to fight. Now, don't get me wrong, I can agree with this, but one thing I've noticed is that they don't give a shit about the people who are victimized by the savagery of the imperialist soldiers. They don't give a shit about the people who are brutally pillaged by the imperialist soldiers. They don't give a shit about the people who are brutally pillaged by the ruling class. You know, they, they're just more than happy to let imperialism carry on without any regard for the lowest privileged people of all in the third world. So for any average British person out there who may be watching this video, it may be a huge surprise or a big shock that a British citizen like myself would even think to sympathise with an organisation like the Irish Republican Army, that is a national liberation movement that has been fighting a guerrilla war and an intelligence operation against the British military for the past 100 years or so. But then if you have a look at my other videos on anti-imperialist movements like the struggle of the Palestinians against the colonial colonial state of Israel, then that huge surprise will more than likely be put to bed. As a Marxist-Leninist, I also support the movements around the world that may not even be communist at all. This is because if we look further, we can see that imperialism is to take over another country's natural resources, utilize their cheap labor, and take over their markets. These actions, as you can see, are actually economic and political, rather than military. Military conquest comes into play only when these things cannot be achieved in any other way. But military 
conquest is not exactly the point, it's just a means to an end, as the ultimate goal of is economic exploitation. This means that countries who stand up for themselves against imperialism by setting up a development path for their own people is a struggle that should be recognised and supported due to that given context. Only when that victory is won do we start to support a socialist revolution in that particular country. So if we look at what the British ruling class has been doing to Ireland for centuries and then look at the way they paint the resistance movements like the IRA, a jigsaw starts to appear and the dots start to connect. Ireland has had a long history of invasions by the British and through the 19th century the country was ruled by the UK directly from London. When Ireland was annexed by the British Empire, one of its main useful resources to the British ruling class was the vast amount of natural resources available in the country. This leads me to the Great Famine of 1845 to 1849, otherwise known as the Irish Potato Famine. The Irish Potato Famine, contrary to the insidious claims of the British ruling class, was a planned massacre to benefit the British Empire. If this comes as a huge surprise, then there is something fundamentally wrong with you. Even the so-called saviour of the world, the oh-so-glorious Winston Churchill, planned the Bengali Famine of 1943 in India with brutal policies. Churchill himself even blamed the Indians for the famine, saying that they were breeding like rabbits. So it shouldn't be a shock to you that the Irish Potato Famine was part and parcel of the British Empire's pillage of Ireland during its imperial glory days. Over a million people died in the period between 1845 and 1850, and millions more emigrated out of the country. But it wasn't the lack of potatoes that killed them. That distinction goes to the diseases and the gunpoint removal and export of wheat, oats, meats, vegetables and dairy products that the Irish themselves had produced by British soldiers. In 1845, the economist to the crown said, and I quote directly, only one million Irish are likely to die and that will not be enough to do much good, close quote. This famine ended in 1849 when British soldiers stopped removing food from Ireland. During this period of the removal of enough food to sustain around 18 million people, the Irish population had significantly dropped Towards the end of the 1800s, a movement called the IRB, or the Irish Republican Brotherhood, was established, and their goal was to create an Irish Republic. This movement was a strong ally to the Gaelic Revival, whose goal was to bring back the old Irish Gaelic culture and the Gaelic language in Ireland. Between the 1880s and the 1890s, the Home Rule movement started getting support from the British Parliament, as they wanted to set up a parliament in Dublin. By the very early 1900s, the movement Sinn Féin, which is Gaelic for we ourselves was set up by Arthur Griffith and the goal of Sinn Féin was for the Irish Parliament not to go to London but to go to Dublin. In 1910 the Home Rule movement gained quite a bit of support but not so much in Northern Ireland because that region was largely Protestant, Unionist and very loyal to Britain. The Unionists in Northern Ireland were against having a Parliament in Dublin because most of Ireland's industry was located in the region of Ulster and the Unionists there believed that an Irish Parliament in Dublin would just end up being run by the Catholic Church. At this point in time Ireland was on the brink of a civil war because the Ulster Volunteers and the Irish Volunteers were at each other's throats. Even though the Home Rule was passed in Ireland, it was stopped in 1914 due to the outbreak of the Inter-Imperialist First World War. Most of the Irish Volunteers ended up joining the British military, but other members stayed behind as the British ruling class was facing a difficult time. So the ones who stayed behind saw it as a good opportunity to fight the British. Ultimately, that's what happened, because the Irish Volunteers who stayed in Ireland started planning the Easter Uprising. The year 1916 marked a year of struggle for the Irish Republican movement. This is because 1916 was the year of the Great Easter Uprising of the 24th of April 1916. This uprising was the most powerful assault to happen from the working class against the inter-imperialist bloodbath of the First World War before the October Socialist Revolution in Russia that happened the following year in 1917. During this uprising, most of central Dublin was was destroyed by the British and even though this uprising killed 500 people and was suppressed by the British followed by the further loss of Irish lives the Easter uprising is marked as a national celebration in the Republic of Ireland the Irish Republican movement set up its Irish volunteer movement or the Irish Republican army as it's known as today and the Irish citizen army that was set up by James Connolly ended up joining the Irish volunteer movement to declare the Republic of Ireland after the uprising the British Empire 
Empire subjected the Irish people to brutal repression in which 16 people were executed. This included all seven signatories of the proclamation of the Irish Republic who began the uprising. 14 people were executed at the Kilmainham jail in Dublin, one of them being James Connolly. Connolly was already heavily wounded after fighting in the uprising against the British, but he was executed while strapped to a chair. In Cork, Thomas Kent was executed and in London, Sir Roger Casement was hanged. But these executions were just a small fraction of the brutal repression that occurred after the uprising because thousands of Irish Republicans were facing a witch hunt, including those who were suspected of working with the Irish Republican movement. Irish Republicans were even thrown into Vrongoch internment camp in Wales. You could say that the Easter uprising of 1916 was immediately defeated if you wanted to, but it would be very foolish not to acknowledge the path it created to the War of Independence that happened between 1919 and 1921. The Easter Uprising proved to be such a defining event of the 20th century, to the point where it has not lost any of its significance to this day. After the surge of support that the Easter Uprising had all over Ireland, the Irish volunteers were starting to plan the next phase of the struggle against British imperialism, guerrilla warfare. So things like ambushes and hit and run tactics to be precise, because Michael Collins, who planned this tactic, saw it to be much more effective and wiser than facing the British military head on. The prisoners who were in Wales were released at the end of 1916 and they returned home to Ireland to carry on the fighting for the cause. In 1918, the inter-imperialist war was still raging in mainland Europe and the British ruling class was threatening the Irish people with conscription into the British military, which only put more petrol into the fire as it made the Irish Republicans hate the British even more. Just when the British thought they had pacified the Irish Republican movement after brutally suppressing the Easter Uprising, they had a huge surprise coming right towards them. One of those surprises being the election that was held in 1918, just after the First World War, in which a vast majority of the Irish people voted for the independence of Ireland from Britain, as Sinn Féin had won a landslide victory. The reason for this was because most of the Irish people believed that Sinn Féin was behind the Easter uprising and that the Irish volunteers weren't. In response to this, Sinn Féin was reorganised by many of the Irish volunteers who had joined Sinn Féin, which matched the Republican agenda and De La Vera became its president. Sinn Féin also set up the first Irish parliament in the Mansion House in Dublin in 1919, as Constance Markovitch, along with the rest of Sinn Féin, didn't take their seats in Westminster. Having declared multiple times over centuries of British rule that Ireland should be independent and free from British tyranny, the Republican movement declared that Ireland should have its own parliament and would not take part in the politics of British imperialism. When that revolutionary movement was elected, holding true to those tenets was the first thing that it did by demonstrating that Ireland will carry on struggling in whatever way is necessary against the British ruling class. At the exact same time that Sinn Féin set up the first Irish parliament in Dublin, Irish volunteers ambushed ICA police officers and the Irish War of Independence independence had begun. Britain had thought that the rebellion had been crushed, but from the struggle that the Irish Republicans fought in against the British loyalists and the British military following the executions and the repression after the Easter Uprising of 1916, the arrogant British imperialists had a huge surprise in store for them. RIC barracks across Ireland were raided by Irish volunteers. This was followed by De La Vera being broken out of the Lincoln prison in England by Michael Collins and Harry Boland. The Metropolitan Police in Dublin had an intelligence division known as G-Men and their job was to spy on Sinn Féin members to keep tabs on them for the British ruling class. One double agent who worked for both the Dublin Metropolitan Police and the Irish Volunteers was Ned Broy who had even managed to sneak Michael Collins into the Dublin Metropolitan Police headquarters to go through their intelligence files. In the chaos of the war, a socialist movement came to power in Limerick called the Limerick Soviet. The autonomous region controlled their own currency for food prices and printed their own newspaper. However, this movement only lasted approximately a fortnight after it was suppressed by the Catholic Church, Irish nationalists and the British Empire. It's April 1919 and Limerick is the very centre of the communist world. In 1917, the Bolshevik Revolution introduced the world to communism. 
Lenin and his radical ideology threatened Western capitalism and terrified the rich and wealthy. Two years later, Limerick embraced this communist ideal and the Limerick Soviet was born. The word Soviet just simply means a workers' council where you take over your local town or your city and you run the economic and political life of the, of the town or city. What was the event that began the Limerick Soviet? Well, I think we find the answer to that here. If we go across Sarsfield Bridge, across the Shannon, out of the military area and up here to the Union Hospital, which is where I think you can say the Limerick Soviet was born. The Limerick Soviet was sparked by the death of Robert Byrne, who was a leading IRA figure and an active trade unionist in the Post Office Union. Uh, Robert Byrne had been in prison and was on hunger strike when he was moved here to the Union Infirmary. Shortly after he arrived here, the local IRA unit decided to mount a rescue attempt. And during the course of the rescue attempt, a gun battle broke out. Robert Byrne was wounded, uh, an RIC man was killed, and another couple of RIC men were injured. Robert Byrne eventually died from his wounds later that evening. And uh, what was the public reaction in Limerick to that? The public reaction was huge. Between 15 and 20,000 people attended his funeral and there was a huge outpouring of sympathy and anger over his death. And what was the British reaction to the whole thing? Well, the British authorities had regarded the whole incident as an open act of defiance and in response to this, they imposed martial law on the city. They imposed a special military area. And what that meant was that if you wanted to go to work in the morning, if you wanted to go for a stroll with your wife on a Sunday afternoon or even go out shopping, you needed to go to your local military barracks to get a, a special permit. And the people of Limerick just spontaneously decided that they weren't going to wear that. This was not something that they would accept and they moved to a strike. All of the workforce of Limerick were out on strike. They took over the bakeries, they took over control of the shops, regulated the supply and the price of food. And then, in a, in a very radical gesture, they needed money as well, and their solution to that was that they printed their own currency. And of course, this began to catch the notice of the outside world. It, the, it, the news of Limerick spread like wildfire, in fact, throughout Ireland, throughout Britain, and even as far as France and the United States. The city of Limerick was virtually in a state of siege today, following the establishment Our of... Wire entanglements have been erected at many points. In Limerick as a military area assumed a new and interesting phase today. Very early on, the Dublin Castle authorities offered them a compromise. The compromise was that the local employers could sign your permit to go to and from work without having to go to the British commander. But John Cronin, who was the carpenter who led the Soviet and his colleagues, they rejected this because they weren't prepared to concede the right of the employers to decide who should go to work no more than the right of the, British, the local British military commander. So that was rejected. And like in a lot of disputes, the rejection of the first compromise actually led to an escalation of the dispute rather than heading it towards a conclusion at that stage. On Easter Sunday, 1919, a thousand young strikers set out to test the establishment's resolve. With no official permits and knowing they couldn't get back in, they left the city, only to return a few hours later. They came down from Cahar Davin, down to the Sarsfield Bridge there. The sentry on the Sarsfield Bridge fired a warning shot and immediately the soldiers who were billeted in the Shannon Rowing Club came out onto the bridge the old tank came out onto the bridge and a couple of armoured cars as well and the bridge was secured um, even more so by the British. But the strikers hadn't come for trouble. They came to make a point. After a peaceful demonstration they took refuge in the working class area of Thomengate and the next morning they commandeered the Ennis train and travelled unopposed and triumphant back into Limerick City. Did that end it? No, not by a long shot. They were quite well set up. They could have continued on uh, for weeks on end. And I think that was leading to the, the broader question of what was going to happen? Was it going to escalate? Would workers in other cities and towns in Ireland show solidarity with Limerick? So what did uh, other trade unionists do around the country? They did a lot of practical things. They raised money, they sent food. A lot of that went into Limerick from rank and file trade unionists around the country. At the level of the national leadership, they decided they would need to come to Limerick and be at the focal point of it. And they convened a secret meeting in the Mechanics Institute. But if the Limerick Soviet hoped for national support, they were to be sorely disappointed. There would be no national strike.
The problem was, of course, now that no general strike was taking place, it was pretty obvious that the Soviet could not be maintained. Within a couple of days, uh, the strike committee declared that any worker who didn't need a permit should return to work. And a few days after that, the British authorities lifted martial law and with no need of passes, the rest of the workers returned to work and the strike finished. The War of Independence was effectively left in the command of Michael Collins when De La Vera left Ireland to seek support from Irish Americans in the United States, where he managed to raise approximately $5.5 million. There was some tension between two factions of Sinn Féin during the struggle for independence, because while one faction of Sinn Féin attended to approach the Dublin Metropolitan Police through the use of non-violent methods like persuasion and boycotting. Collins' section, however, saw this to be ineffective, so he organized a group that was known as the Squad, and they used guerrilla methods by targeting and assassinating agents from the G Division of the Dublin Metropolitan Police. The Irish Parliament became increasingly concerned that the Irish volunteers were becoming quite sectarian, which is why they were reorganized into the IRA, or the Irish Republican Army. Cork was looted and burned by the British military after an attack by volunteers in the IRA that killed one British soldier and David Lloyd George who was the British Prime Minister had made the Irish Parliament which was known as Dal Arin illegal but they were still considering the possibility of the Home Rule movement that was essentially a British Parliament in Dublin and in Belfast because <coughs> imperialism A heavy duty division of law enforcers called the Royal Irish Constabulary Special Reserve, that was a brutal division that slaughtered Irish civilians, was put together in 1920 by the British Secretary of State for War, who was none other than Winston Churchill, who everyone loves so much. The RIC Special Reserve wore a uniform which gave them the infamous nickname the Black and Tans. The Black and Tans were fucking brutal as they indiscriminately shot at civilians and destroyed civilian property. Many of of the soldiers in the RIC Special Reserve were in fact British veterans from the First World War and it also had some Irish members as well. When civilians approach, shout hands up. Should the order not be obeyed, shoot and shoot with effect. If any persons approaching you carry their hands in their pockets or are in any way suspicious looking, shoot them down. You may make mistakes occasionally and innocent persons may be shot. But you're bound to get the right person sometimes. The more you shoot, the better I will like you. And I assure you that no policeman will get in trouble for shooting any man. And I guarantee your names will not be given at the inquest. An unarmed body of men fighting. Uh, one of the biggest empires at that time in the world. Armed to the teeth with tanks, guns and God knows what. There was nothing left to us except uh, guerrilla tactics. It was quite easy for us to do it because the people were with us. We had no enemies, only the British forces. It was never really clarified was whether they were to behave like soldiers or policemen. Their mixture of army and police uniforms symbolized their ambivalent role and gave them a nickname, the Black and Tans. As they patrolled the Irish countryside, their enemy was the IRA flying columns. Groups of 20 men or so constantly on the move, attacking them and then melting into the countryside. A roadblock might be an ambush. Experience on the Western Front proved irrelevant when dealing with guerrillas, and the fight against an unseen enemy was both bewildering and frustrating. <laughs> 
Throughout 1920, there were a number of hunger strikes and conflicts between the Catholic and Protestant regions of Ireland, as well as Irish Catholics being driven out of work by British loyalists in Belfast. The Dal courts had replaced the British legal system and the Irish people refused to take part in British courts. But one incident of a hunger strike that brought unwanted international attention to Britain was the death of a prisoner named Terence McSweeney, who died in an English prison because he and three other prisoners refused to eat for three months. But the most infamous day of the Irish War of Independence came on the 21st of November 1920. This was because when the British Intelligence Service sent in a group called the Cairo Gang, the IRA had gathered enough information on the group. So Collins ordered for the assassination of various British agents and in a coordinated attack, 13 British agents across Dublin were killed by the IRA along with two civilians. But on the very same day, the Auxiliary Division, who had a very similar reputation to the Black and Tans, were sent in as reinforcements to the Black and Tans, who at a Gaelic football match indiscriminately shot at the crowd. In this massacre, 14 people were killed, which is why that day became known as Bloody Sunday. Across Ireland, martial law started spreading, and after an auxiliary division that was stationed in Cork was attacked by the IRA, the British burned the city centre. The Black and Tans deliberately delayed the firefighters, while civilians were indiscriminately shot at. Ireland was basically at war with Britain, but towards the end of 1920, the British government had passed the law of the Government of Ireland Act. This act is what divided Ireland through a partition and because the Unionists who were very loyal to the British had control over six northeastern counties of the country the Belfast Parliament effectively controlled these six counties and it ultimately formed the country that we know as today called Northern Ireland the other 26 counties on the other hand were controlled by the Parliament in Dublin and those counties formed Southern Ireland although both Northern and Southern Ireland were still British colonies at the time Ireland was still divided the British government decided to call for a truce in 1921 because the British authorities and the IRA were at a stalemate. David Lloyd George wrote to the Irish Parliament and both agreed on a truce. On the 11th of July 1921 the truce came into effect and Michael Collins along with Arthur Griffith went to England to negotiate a treaty. In this truce an Irish Republic let alone a united Irish Republic was not one of the options on the table. Essentially Ireland was divided between North and South in a partition by imperialism, just like Korea was after 1953. The negotiation between the IRA and the British authorities led to the Anglo-Irish Treaty that created the partition between Northern Ireland and the Republic of Ireland that we can see today. A 26-county Irish free state was created, but it became a dominion of the British Empire, like Australia or Canada. The king remained the head of state and Britain still had control over three strategic ports in the country. This treaty also meant that Northern Ireland remained under British rule and the treaty is what also enforced the imperialist partition on Ireland. This ultimately caused the IRA to split into two factions. One faction agreed with the circumstances of the treaty as they believed that this was the best they would get after their relentless struggle for independence, while another faction disagreed with the circumstances of the treaty. After the split, a new IRA was formed in 1922 that was not only fighting against British imperialism but also against the former IRA members who had agreed to the treaty in 1921. Even throughout the 20th century, the IRA has been reorganized quite a few times. The IRA has changed their name to the Official IRA, the Provisional IRA, the Continuity IRA and the Real IRA. Northern Ireland was now experiencing rioting on a scale not seen for many years. In London Derry, during the early hours of the morning, a thousand plastic bullets were fired. Police and soldiers faced an equal number of petrol bombs. The rioters were prepared to take enormous risks to make their point.
Republican was killed. In the period between 1968 and 1998, there was a violent conflict in the six northeastern counties of Ireland. It was a conflict between the IRA and the Ulster Unionists, who had the support of the British military. Just like any national liberation movement, the IRA were branded as bloodthirsty terrorists by the British ruling class. Throughout the territories that Britain has occupied, the British military has always used death squads. In 2012, an archive that was full of documents that detailed the torture and the execution of citizens in the former British colonies was unearthed. These documents were destroyed before the colonies in question received independence from Britain, but other documents were stored away secretly in London. Now, these documents were released, but not as a way of the British ruling class trying to rebrand itself for once, because the victims had launched a successful lawsuit against them to access the documents. Genocide and pillage were very commonplace throughout the British Empire, from the systematic murder of communists in Malaya to the massacre of the land and freedom army fighters in Kenya. British ministers were not only fully aware of these atrocities that included men being roasted alive, but they actually sanctioned murder and torture on an industrial scale. Indeed, many of the British commanders who were stationed in Northern Ireland during the 1970s also previously served in the British colonies of Africa and Asia. The local populations were often regarded as inferior and uncivilized in these territories and were subjected to some of the most brutal methods of oppression. In the streets of Belfast and Derry, this dehumanization continued and also throughout Northern Ireland. Britain had installed Frank Kitson as a commander in Northern Ireland in 1970 and he had received a military cross for crushing the Kenyan uprising and was then awarded a bar to it for brutally suppressing the Malayan National Liberation Army, which was the military arm of the Communist Party of Malaya. The brutal oppression by the British police, the British military and the loyalist death squads had unleashed horror on Republican communities in Northern Ireland because pubs were bombed, civilians were harassed, shot and killed, Republican volunteers were tortured and executed. So they basically subjugated an entire population to systematic terror without any accountability. While the ultimate goal of the IRA was to further the cause for the reunification of Ireland as a republic, it was also a cause that was vital to protect the communities that the British military were terrorizing. Also, despite the British ruling class portraying the IRA as cold-blooded killers who have no public support, the movement was very successful in reducing the number of British soldiers on the streets of Ireland, and through that they managed to win a range of civil rights for Republican communities and the IRA has now developed into a powerful political force that is moving further towards achieving the reunification of Ireland. This major split between the two factions of the IRA and also the reorganizations of the IRA that followed it are a clear sign that the IRA struggle against British imperialism is far from over. So comrades, going back to my introduction of this video, the reason why I sympathize with the Republican movement in Ireland is because we as Marxist Leninists should recognize the IRA as a genuine anti-imperialist imperialist resistance against the British ruling class. The IRA have been and still are struggling for the independence of Northern Ireland from British occupation and for the reunification of Ireland as a republic. The struggle against British imperialism has presented itself to the IRA as a struggle that is and has been incredibly violent. But in the process of a struggle for national liberation, a certain number of deaths is to be expected. That's just common sense. So even though the IRA may not be a socialist movement at all. It is definitely an anti-imperialist movement that I can sympathize with, due to the given context that they are fighting against British imperialism in Northern Ireland. The British press and the ruling class in general will be quick to tell you that any national liberation movement, like the IRA, are baby-eating monsters that are standing against the interests of the good old British democratic values. But the reason why they do that, comrades, is to keep us subjugated, to keep us from knowing that the reason why Britain has invaded and colonized other countries in the past was for their natural resources. As Malcolm X once said, the press can make you love those who are oppressing us and hate those who are being oppressed. Finally, comrades, I'd like to read out a quote by Bobby Sands, and this quote says, There can never be peace in Ireland until the foreign oppressive British presence is removed, leaving all the Irish people as a unit to control their own affairs and determine their own destinies as a sovereign people. 
free in mind and body, separate and distinct physically, culturally and economically.